Chapter 20, verses 24 and 25, book of John. Now Thomas called the twin, yes, me, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful day on earth, and thank you for letting us all gather here. Please be with everyone previously mentioned earlier this morning on the prayer list, and 
people mentioned here tonight. Please be with us so that everything done here might be pleasing in your eye. Forgive us for when we fail you and be with us so we can do better. And it's your son, Sir Jesus, name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me put this down for a second. Twenty-five, anywhere with Jesus. That's what I know. Anywhere with Jesus I can say. Yeah. 
say in the past, I've thought it myself once or twice, that if I could have lived in the times when God was performing miracles, how much easier it would be to know and understand what God wants for us. That's not necessarily true. We have several examples in the Bible. I'm going to talk about a couple of them this evening. In Acts chapter 12, and I'm not going to ask Allie to put this up on the screen because it's a long uh, passage. But in Acts chapter 12, Tells us that Herod is king. That would be a grip of one. And he decided that he was going to harass or cause problems for these Christians. He has James, the brother of John, killed. And that pleased the it says the Jews in the Bible, but it's really talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders of the Jewish church or religion at that time. And since that made them happy, he went ahead and arrested Peter too and put him in jail. No doubt he had the exact same plans for Peter. But it was the time of the Passover. According to Jewish religion, he couldn't try him and behead him during the Passover. We have record saying that the Christians were gathered together praying fervently for Peter's release. And in verse 7, we see where an angel appears and the prison's lit up. And the angel smacks Peter and says, wake up, get up, come on. When Peter stands up, he's chained between two guards. And when he stands up, the chains fall from his arms. <laughs> There's still two more guard posts to, to pass on the way out of prison. But they pass them. And then they get out into the street and they, they come up to the iron gate leading to the city. If you've studied very much about the culture at this time, these people built fortified cities or walled cities so that the enemy couldn't just come in on them. And at night, the gates were closed. It doesn't take very much imagination 
to understand that in order to do the commerce of the time, that these would have to be fairly large gates. They have to take oxen and other animals of burden through their dragging carts, dragging whatever is needed to bring in the supplies that those people need to live, to build, to make repairs. But as Peter and the angel approach this gate, it simply opens up for them to come in. Now as you read on down through, you see that the angel leaves Peter at this place. If you're paying attention to the context there, up until this point in time, Peter is pretty sure that he's just dreaming or having a vision. Peter, who walked with the Lord, seen all the miracles that Jesus had performed up until this point isn't sure himself whether or not this is real but once the angel leaves he considers his situation he goes to the house of Mary the mother of John where these Christians are gathered praying for. I want to stop right there. By my king, and this depends upon whether you want to say that passing these guard stations on the way out of the prison is a miracle or not. I've counted six miracles at this point. In that the chains fell from his hands, the prison is lighted miraculously. Not by any source that they would know. It says there was a light fell into the prison. An angel appears. That's a miracle in itself. An angel, a light, Change dropping away, passing two guard stations. What do I got? Five? Somewhere there's a sixth in there. Huh? The gates. The gate swings open. At this point, there is six. By my count. If you want to count it differently, that's fine. I don't think any of us will deny that there's at least one. Peter goes to this house and he knocks on the gate or the outer entrance. It's shut. It's locked. A young servant or a young girl, a girl named Rhoda goes to answer. Obviously she's going to ask who it is. Peter, let me in. She is so overjoyed that she forgets to open the door. She goes running back inside to tell everybody, Peter is here. I find this interesting. There is a group of Christians here Praying, <coughs> praying. They gathered for this reason. To pray for Peter's release. What is their answer to Rhoda? When she notifies them that Peter's standing at the gate. <coughs> I haven't let him in, but he's out there. <laughs> lost your mind. You're beside yourself. 
These people, I'm sure some of them had witnessed Christ himself, had heard him teach, maybe had seen him heal the sick. Most certainly, if they're close friends of Peter's, they've likely seen Peter perform miracles. They just can't believe that Peter is free and standing at their gate. Finally, somebody decides that the easy way to solve it is to go open that gate. And Peter comes in and talks to him. He ends up going away from the city. People, these people witness miracles like we can't hope to see today. <clears throat> I also find it interesting that surprisingly enough, Peter was having more trouble getting into this house with these friends than he had getting out of prison. Let's look at another passage. In Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, Jesus enters a synagogue to teach there, or to teach. There's a man there with a withered hand. I don't see too many people with leprosy nowadays. I don't see too many people with some of the diseases that they talk about in the Bible, mainly because of our health practices nowadays. The medicine that God has granted doctors to have the knowledge of But I still see people that are lame and blind and people with withered hands. There's a man here with a withered hand and Jesus standing there looks about and realizes that the scribes and Pharisees are watching. This is the Sabbath day. We don't work on the Sabbath day. Let's see what Jesus does here. Let's see if he does something that we can use against him. Jesus asked this man to stand at a particular place and and then looks around at these Pharisees and Sadducees and says, What? Well, is it legal? Or is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? And then he told this man, Stretch forth your hand. He says something that's impossible for this man to do <laughs> by physical standards. And he did so, and his hand was restored. These people didn't even have time to forget. miracle performed by Christ. It says they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. And 
modern medicine as we know it today cannot repair a withered hand. They might do hundreds of surgeries and get just a little bit more movement or get that hand just a little bit better shape than it was. They're not going to repair it. Christ simply said, stretch your hand out here and it was right. And these people witnessed that miracle and were unwilling to believe in Christ and the power of God. I look at the book of Exodus. These Israelites were led out of Egypt don't even start with a verse. You'll never get to a moment time. <laughs> These Israelites were led out of Egypt against the Israelite or er, Egyptian will. As a matter of fact, they took a bunch of the Egyptians' riches and gold with them. They took all their own possessions with them. They go out there and the Egyptian army pursues them. And they're crowded right into a rock and a hard place, as we like to say. Nowhere to run. They don't have the weapons to fight. God parts the Red Sea. They go through it. And the Red Sea collapses on the Egyptians. I don't know how long it took from the far bank of the Red Sea to reach Canaan. But in that time, those people had forgotten the miracle that God had performed. The miracles. Because when they were told to go into the land and possess it, they said, I didn't think it was too strong. Hebrews chapter 11 starting in verse 4 the writer there gives a long list of people who did things by faith Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, <coughs> Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the Israelites, Walt, uh, when the walls of Jericho fell, it was by faith. Rahab was saved alive by faith. Gideon, Barak, Samson, <laughs> Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. He lists all of those people. Winning by faith. He finishes up that thought. In Hebrews chapter 12, I should, he summarizes that thought in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. When he says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer in Hebrews knew this. These accounts that were written in the Old Testament was so that we would know and understand that we needed to trust in the one true and living God. That we did not have to see the miracles performed because we had already had them recorded for us. I 
I'd like to, to finish tonight with one, one further verse. It's John chapter 20 and 29. Please don't put it up just yet. Go ahead and look at it. The Bible is filled with examples of people of great faith. It's filled with people who have done things that we can't imagine doing ourselves. Through the power of God. Not on their own. Those examples are not written to brag on those people. They're written so that we can know that what God says he'll do, he'll do. Including resurrecting us from the dead. Including giving us a home in heaven. A profound faith. The verse was read at the beginning of this lesson beginning of these services was Thomas telling the other apostles <clears throat> who had told him that we've seen Jesus we've, we've talked with him we've walked with him and Thomas says so I see his hands turn the nails and put my finger into the Print of the nails and put my uh, put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side. I will not. Well, just a few short verses later, he does see Jesus. Jesus said, "Let me see your hands. Here, put your fingers here." Let me show you, because I want you to believe. I want you to know that it's me. And then he tells Thomas one other thing. He says, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It doesn't take the miracles for us to believe in the power of the one true and living God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a record of those miracles. We need to know and understand that He is the Lord. I believe that everyone in this room this evening is a Christian. If you're finding your load heavy to bear, if you just need prayers and encouragement from the church, I hope we know that we stand in the sun. Someday you'll stand at the bar on high. Someday you'll rest. Whoa!
Son's righteous name we pray. Amen. Amen.